Welcome to our final lesson on the order of worship. So if you stuck around with me for these uh, three lessons, the first one was the gathering, the second one was the word, and now we're going to do the last two, which is the meal and the sending. So the meal, I think, is kind of self-explanatory. That is what happens when we participate in Holy Communion here at the altar, and sometimes, depending on your tradition, the back altar. And this period of the service, of the order of the service, is really kind of the pinnacle of why we worship. It is the place where we encounter Christ in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Now, there are some differing thoughts. Martin Luther actually was a fan of the freestanding altar, which is what we have here. Uh, where the priest, would be me, faces the people. And I think it's important that we recognize that when I have all those, like, garbs on, the, the stole and the chasuble, or sometimes called the Christian poncho, uh, that is to help remove my individualness and to allow the congregation to visually see that Chad is no longer here and that I am kind of stepping in the place of Christ as I lift up the elements of Christ's sacrifice. Um, so it's not that I, Chad, become Jesus. It's kind of meant to wipe away my own personal identity and allow our focus to be purely on Jesus, which is on the table here. And the thought process is, is that when we're at a freestanding altar, the, the pastor is no longer in the place of the pastor. Rather, we are in the place of Christ, which means that Christ is staring back at you. Uh, and the elements are there to be lifted out into the congregation so that it's not meant to be a sacrifice to God. It's not meant to look like a sacrifice to God. Uh, because the sacrifice is to us. It's God's sacrifice to us. So when I lift up the elements, it's not meant to be seen as I'm giving it to God. It's meant to be seen that God is giving it to you. Uh, and we are all participating together. So there's kind of that difference. Now, personally, I think optics-wise, it's better to use the back-facing altar because then I am facing towards God and the elements are kind of the focal point. But again, you still run into that issue where it looks like we're sacrificing it to God. Um, and that's just not what we're doing, although it can optically look like that. So there are different, definitely differing opinions on this. Uh, should we use the back-facing or east-facing altar, or should we use freestanding? Martin Luther was for the freestanding altar, and current modern uh, Lutheran liturgy is in favor of freestanding altar. So is most of Christendom. Um, so I kind of have an unpopular opinion there. But because of unity within the church, I encourage freestanding altars. Uh, because I do get, I do understand the point uh, it is Christ facing the congregation, not me as the pastor. And the elements are then within the congregation, and they aren't in front of the congregation necessarily. Uh, so that's just kind of why some of those practices, they may look a little weird, but there's really no other way to kind of show this um, physical representation of Jesus' sacrifice. Uh, without lifting it up and, and showing it among the people, other than maybe literally getting up and walking amongst the people. Uh, that might be a way to, to show that it's not a sacrifice to God, but a sacrifice for all of us. Um, and in some some practices, and I think maybe it has happened here at Trinity and St. Peter's, but the elements are actually in the back, and then they are brought forward during during the offering. And that's to symbolize that the elements are coming through the congregation and then they are being presented onto the altar. 
And that's just another representation of the, the sacrifices within the people. It's for the people. It's not for God. And as I said before, we kind of have this movement towards making the altar the kind of climax or the pinnacle of our worship service rather than preaching. And I think that's a good thing, especially for those who are already believers. But I can kind of see the downfall when you aren't a strong believer or maybe you're new to the faith. Good preaching can change lives. Good preaching can help us see how God is working in our current lives and in the world today. So if the preaching is lagging, it doesn't necessarily mean that the elements are going to take over any laxing uh, theology that happened over at the pulpit. Uh, now, preachers get grace too, and we're not going to be perfect in everything that we preach, but preaching still should should be a focal point. It should, still should be quality preaching, in my opinion. And I hope that I live up to that expectation of myself and to others. Uh, but the elements are really for those who are strong believers. Those who understand what it means to be participating in communion. We are literally gnawing on the flesh of Christ and we are drinking the blood of Christ. It doesn't necessarily make us cannibals. Um, I guess it does a little bit. Um, but what it means is that we are literally consuming the body of Christ. And when we consume food, when we consume um, Jesus' body and blood, uh, Jesus literally becomes a part of us. So that's kind of what the, the theology is trying to get us to understand, is that when we consume Christ, it becomes a part of our DNA. It becomes a part of who we are. And if it's not the literal body and blood of Christ, then it, it's just not as meaningful. If it's purely just a symbol of what happened in the past, then there is no real change for us today. So when the words of institution are stated, the body and blood become the body and blood of Jesus. The bread and wine truly are the full presence of Christ. And when we take that bread and drink that wine, we are encountering the presence, the true presence of Christ. Now, Lutherans aren't um, as cannibalistic in their theology as, say, um, Catholics are. So Catholics literally believe that the blood is then, that the wine is then blood and the bread is then like flesh. Lutherans do believe that, but they also believe that the element of bread is still there and that the element of wine is still there. So it's a both and rather than a actual transformation. So the Catholics believe in transubstantiation and the Lutherans, we believe in consubstantiation. So bread is still bread, but it still is also flesh and wine is still wine, but it also is the blood. Um, where in Catholics, the bread actually is body and the wine is actually blood. So if you took a DNA test of those two things, it would come back as human flesh and human blood. Um, that's kind of the where they're trying to get to. And, and I can see on how that is an important theology. Um, and I don't really quite always understand why Luther made a huge point in saying that the bread is still bread and the wine is still wine, uh, because the point is still the same. We believe that the true presence is here at the table and that we are consuming Jesus as his full presence, um, and same as the Catholics. Uh, so that's kind of where I want us to, to kind of lean on, is that we are consuming Christ, and Christ is becoming a part of us in, it, in, in, in Christ's fullness. And uh, just like in the water, where the Holy Spirit, the whole Holy Spirit kind of awakens uh, the presence of God within us and brings us into the fullness of the Christian community. Holy Communion, the meal, well, that reminds us of our baptism, and it also gives us a weekly chance to be in the true, full presence of God. And I think that's kind of amazing.
So I can see how, you know, the table is very, very important. But I think preaching is very important too. It helps, everything leads us to the table. Okay, so that's the meal. Now the sending. Why is it important to send us out? Why is it important to have something in our liturgy that, says, liturgy that says, get out of here? Well, that's because worship is not the end. Worship is the start. Sunday is not the end of the week. It's the beginning. It is where we come and then we go. We are here to be fulfilled in our need to worship God. We are here to give our praise and our thanks to, to Jesus for what he's done. We are here to participate in in the salvation of Jesus Christ for our sins. And then we are meant to go out into the world, be proclaimers of what we experienced here, and to do Christ's work in the world. Worship is not the end, it is the beginning. It is the start of something, it is not the end. And all of this that we do, the gathering, the word, the meal, it is all meant to send us out into the world, prepared to proclaim the world saved and to do God's work in the world, to be the hands and feet of Christ. And in our baptism, we promised to do that. In our participation in the meal, we are given the strength and the assurance that Christ is with us as we do that. And the and every single week as we come back, if we don't live up to that expectation, which we probably never will, we were always brought back into the fold through confession and forgiveness and back to give us another chance through the table, through our baptism, through the word, through the gathering of God's faithful people to go and be who God needs us to be in this world. I hope that this was uh, useful and informative. And if you have any questions, always feel free to, to reach out to me, and I'd be happy to enter into dialogue with you. And check out that book that I have been recommending. It's dense, but informative. All right, God's blessings in your Lenten journey, and I'll see you in Holy Week next week. God's blessings. Bye.